My shepherd I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let's pray. We thank you, Father, that you are our Lord and King, you're our shepherd, and you watch over us as your sheep. We thank you for our Savior who has redeemed us from sin and brought us into your kingdom. We pray that as we gather in your courts where there is the water of life, where we may feed on the wonders and beauties and riches of your word, we pray that your spirit would bless us, strengthen us for our worship, and also strengthen us for the work ahead in the week before us. We ask for your blessing on us in Jesus' name. Amen. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's continue to stand and we'll sing our opening hymn, The God of Abram Praise. Hymn number 34. Oh uh-huh. 
even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. We see how David received the Ark of the Covenant into the city, and it was an anticipation of the coming of the Lord himself, who enters into the city with great glory. The Lord is the glorious one who has entered into the heavenly city, Lord Jesus, triumph over sin and death, and through his victory, he's received gifts from the Father and given them to us, spiritual blessings, which he's given to us, including redemption, forgiveness of our sins, and an everlasting inheritance, the great blessing we have in knowing Christ. We'll consider our lesson from the shorter catechism this morning. This is questions number 76 through 78 on truthfulness. The questions and their answers are as follows. Which is the ninth commandment? The ninth commandment is, Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. What is required in the ninth commandment? The ninth requires excuse me, the ninth commandment requires the maintaining and promoting of truth between man and man, and of our own and our neighbor's good name, especially in witness bearing. What is forbidden in the ninth commandment? The ninth commandment forbiddeth whatsoever is prejudicial to truth or injurious to our own or our neighbor's good name. Jesus said to those around him that uh, by your words you will be judged. And he warned uh, the folks of his day against the light use of words and of language, of uh, saying things that are false, meaningless, uh, frivolous, or what have you. Uh, we will be judged by our words. And so uh, language is a very important thing to God. Jesus himself is the word of God, and it's by his speech that he brought all things into existence. So God is one who communicates. He reveals himself through his word. And the way in which we come to know him is through that divine speech. That speech is not only sitting there out in the air, but God has arranged that that speech be written down for us so that we might know exactly what God has said to us. And so God's verbal speech is written as well for our good and well-being. And so God is very much concerned for truth and truthfulness. In fact, when you go through the scriptures, you find that God predicts events and then uh, demonstrates his truthfulness by bringing them actually to pass. And there are many predictions in the Old Testament that you can find fulfilled either in the Old Testament or in the New Testament times in Jesus Christ. God is faithful to his word. When he promises, those promises are fulfilled. God is also faithful in that which he says. His 
statements, his declarations are true. So everything that God says, we can believe. We can trust that what he said is a true and accurate description of the world, of ourselves, and of himself. And so there's no cause to doubt the word of God. And so God gives us promises. He gives us statements or declarations. He also gives us commands. And those commands are meaningful, clear. They're easily understood on the whole. And we should uh, apply ourselves to them and yield our lives to them. Well, if this is something of the character of God, then it should be reflected in us who are His redeemed people. We also should speak the truth. Uh, the Apostle Paul urges us to speak the truth one to the other. And then to Titus, he uh, speaks about those in the island of Crete who were uh, lazy and were liars. Uh, they constantly lied. Uh, maybe they were selling real estate or maybe they, <laughs> they were doing other things like that. But I, I digress. Uh, they were constantly misrepresenting things. In a modern age, it seems to me that our world is filled with lies. There are lies all over the place. The news media is filled with lies. And we need to be very discerning in what we hear. We have to listen uh, to uh, more than just one witness to uh, the take on events. We need to hear both sides of the story so that we can uh, sift and determine what is true, distinguish it from that which is false. And so in an age that is uh, filled with lies of many sorts, uh, we need to be discerning in what we hear and apply ourselves to wisdom. Uh, but we should be those ourselves who also speak the truth. Sometimes speaking the truth is a very uh, delicate thing. Uh, it might mean that we have to say something to someone that is hard to hear and hard to say. Uh, but sometimes hard truths need to be spoken. I'm very much aware of that in preaching as you deliver God's word from week to week, you're conscious of how that word may affect some members within the congregation, and certainly also how it reflects on you. Uh, none of us who are pastors are perfect by any means, and we are very much aware of our own shortcomings and, and sins. And so it is incumbent upon us always to speak the truth, even when it is difficult. Say that which God has spoken and speak the truth in our relationships to each other. Um, the commandment comes to us in the form of bearing witness. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. And so the context is clearly in a law court where you are compelled to bring testimony with regard to the actions of a neighbor or a friend. And under those circumstances, you must not bring false witness. It might be very tempting to shade the truth, to uh, give a misleading answer, to actually tell a falsehood and think that you will get away with it. Uh, there have been those who were uh, coordinated in an effort to lie, even under oath, and uh, to bring harm to others. You recall the story uh, with regard to uh, Ahab and Jezebel and how there was a vineyard nearby owned by a fellow named Naboth and some uh, Jezebel. Ahab wanted the vineyard. Naboth refused it. Jezebel said to Ahab, well, you're king. You can do what you want. So she went off and arranged to have a couple of scurrilous individuals come and give false testimony about Naboth such that he was killed. Then Ahab was able to come in and take over the property. So there are some who will even lie under oath and we need to be aware of that. But the context is in the courtrooms. And certainly when people's lives and reputation are on the stake, we should be very, very truthful. Uh, very truthful. Um, so that is kind of the extreme circumstance in which our testimony needs to be very, very true. But certainly that can, considers all of our testimony, everything that we should say should be truthful. doesn't mean that we always say everything that needs to be said, or excuse me, that can be said. Uh, there is a place for discretion and tact, 
a word uh, given suitably at the right time is uh, highly desired. Proverbs speaks of a word in time as being like apples of gold and settings of silver. It's very precious. And so be very careful about what you say. Uh, there is the sin of gossiping where you might be saying something true, but somebody else doesn't need to hear it. Uh, and so you need to protect uh, a, a, an individual's reputation by preserving the information that you might have that might not be very, if you will, flattering. In any case, we should speak the truth and be known by our truthful conduct in life. All of this reflects on our Savior who is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the truth. And so if we wish to know truth, we must first know Jesus. He orients our mind in such a way that we are enabled to see truth. Natural man is still blinded by his sin and can never properly perceive the world around him. It's always tainted by his rebellion against God, his hostility towards God. And so in many respects, everything that he says in the ultimate context of things is a lie. And it reflects the fact that Satan himself is a liar from the beginning. And sin comes in in the form of deception and lies to us, promising good but delivering evil. Jesus is one who is the truth, and we can rest in him and his revelation of the Father to us. Let's take a moment to pray and bring our requests to the Lord in prayer. We thank you, Father, that you are uh, sovereign over all areas of our life, not only in the things that we do, but even in the things that we say. And descending even further, you are the Lord of our thoughts. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to be mindful of your truthfulness and how you demand truth in the innermost being. And we pray, O Lord, that you would help us then to uh, be taught and instructed from your word in the truth and to conform our thinking and our way of life and our speech to that which you have given to us. We pray, Lord, that your blessing would be on your word, that as it does go forth uh, faithfully, that your spirit would bless it, adding the power of regeneration and of new life to your word. We pray that you would rescue uh, those who should be saved. We thank you, Lord, for your work in our midst, and we thank you for your goodness to us. We pray for your provision for our spiritual needs. We thank you for Rick and Lois and for their vacation this week. We pray that you protect and bless them as they travel, as they visit with Rick's mom, Betty, and leave with his sister as well. But we do pray that your blessing will be on those visits. And we do pray that um, they would be able to return home refreshed and filled with joy and thanksgiving for the time that they've been able to spend uh, with family and friends. Father, we pray that you would bring healing to those who, are, who continue to need your healing touch. Uh, we thank you for watching over uh, Ryan this week and the oral surgery he underwent. We do pray that you would continue to give him healing. And pray, Lord, that uh, as he follows this path, that your blessing would be on that, and that you would give him great joy in that which you've done for him. We pray, Lord, that you would uh, also be with Mary. Uh, Pauline's uh, sister-in-law, that as she recovers from heart bypass surgery, that your uh, hand of blessing will be on her. Pray, Lord, that she would have a full and complete recovery. Uh, we thank you for the new vow that she has received and pray that that would uh, work effectively for her. We pray that your blessing will be on Pauline and Chuck as they uh, care for, encourage, and exhort their brother and sister-in-law. And Lord, we pray that you, you would watch over them. We thank you, Lord, for your care for Heidi over this past year, over a year now. And we do pray for your continued uh, care for her, that you would give her healing and health. Strengthen her, O Lord, to rest in you. Give her patience as she deals with uh, her, her health. And we do pray that she would be restored to full health and strength again soon. We thank, too, of Rhoda, and we thank you, Lord, for her faith in you and for her 
uh, commitment of her future to your care. We pray that as her son makes plans to provide a home, a place for them, a place of safety uh, with him, we pray, Lord, that that would go well. And we do ask that you would watch over her, pray that she would not be um, subject to the, the disease of Parkinson's, Lord, we do pray that you would deliver her from that, and pray, Lord, that you would uh, watch over her and Emmanuel. We thank you for Manny and for his time with us. We pray that as he also is experiencing the uh, effects of aging and the weakness of the body, we pray, Lord, that you would bless him, that your spirit would work in his heart, and we pray that you would encourage him to trust in the Lord and to commit himself to you and to your care. Father, we do pray for Chrissy. We thank you that her infection has receded, at least the last word, and we do pray, Lord, that you would give her complete healing, relief, and strength. We pray that you would bless her and her husband. We thank you for the new employment opportunity before her. We pray that she would be able to take that up before long, and we pray, Lord, for your care and provision for them. Continue to pray for Melissa and pray that you would watch over her as she manages her heart condition. And we pray, Lord, that if in some way it's possible that her heart would be strengthened and that her health would improve, that she would not need uh, any procedures. And we pray, Lord, for your care and provision for her. Be with Joe. We pray, Lord, that you would strengthen him and his health, give him relief from his diabetes and the difficulties on his knees, and uh, we do pray, Lord, for your blessing on him, and thank you for him. Father, we pray that you would be with uh, our church at large. We thank you, Lord, for uh, those who are here and for your uh, grace to us. We pray, Lord, that you would sustain our health, bless us in our homes and families. We pray, Lord, that you would fill us with joy, and we pray, Lord, that you would be glorified in us. Be with those who are at a distance from us, and we pray, Lord, that you would also minister to their spiritual needs, even as they fellowship with us uh, uh, through, through videos and in other ways. We pray for our country. We pray, Lord, that you would uh, bless uh, our nation, forgive us for our great sins, deliver us from tyranny, from oppression, deliver us from those who would uh, seek to impose their their will upon us in ways which are ungodly, unhelpful, uh, harmful. We pray, Lord, that you would defend our liberties and freedoms. We thank you for that and pray that you would strengthen your church throughout this country to, be, to bear faithful witness to our community on the issues of justice and righteousness and truth. Father, we pray that you would bless our Orthodox Presbyterian Church. We thank you for the General Assembly meeting now in Sioux City, Iowa. We pray, Lord, that as they will be completing their deliberations soon, that your hand of blessing will be on the uh, commissioners. We pray, Lord, that the various decisions that they need to be made uh, will be blessed to the peace and furtherance of the gospel. We pray, Lord, that you would defend our church from false teaching, defend us from false lifestyles as well. Help us, O oh Lord, to honor the sanctity of marriage and of life and of uh, property and so forth. We pray, Lord, for your blessing in our church that we would bear faithful witness to Jesus Christ and to his atonement on the cross. We thank you for our time together this morning. Pray for your blessing on us. We would ask that you would teach us to pray, even as our Lord taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our next hymn is hymn number is that 336. Spirit, strength of all the weak. Number 336, we'll sing verses 1 through 3 and verse 6. Let's stand to sing. Oh! 
Exodus chapter 7, and we'll pick up our reading at the 14th verse. We have a fair bit of reading here. As I considered how to approach these 10 plagues, I thought I didn't want to spend 10 weeks on different plagues. I thought that would get to be rather monotonous. And so I want to break these plagues down into about three or four uh, sets. So uh, today we'll talk about the plagues on the Nile River. And I'll explain a little bit of that as we go along. And then we'll group some of the other plagues under different categories as well. So beginning with the 14th verse, we read, Then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hardened. He refuses to let the people go. Go to Pharaoh in the morning, as he is going out to the water. Stand on the bank of the Nile to meet him, and take in your hand the staff that turned into a serpent. You shall say to him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, sent me to you, say, Let my people go, that they may serve me in the wilderness. But so far you have not obeyed. Thus says the Lord. By this you shall know that I am the Lord. Behold, with the staff that is in my hand, I will strike the water that is in the Nile, and it shall turn into blood. The fish in the Nile shall die. The Nile will stink. The Egyptians will grow weary of drinking water from the Nile. And the Lord said to Moses, Say to Aaron, Take your staff and stretch out your hand over the waters of Egypt, over their rivers, their canals, and their ponds, and all their pools of water, so that they may become blood. And there shall be blood throughout all the land of Egypt even in vessels of wood and in vessels of stone. Moses and Aaron did as the Lord commanded. In the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants, he lifted up the staff and struck the water in the Nile. And all the water in the Nile turned into blood. And the fish in the Nile died, and the Nile stank so that the Egyptians could not drink water from the Nile. There is blood throughout all the land of Egypt. But the magicians of Egypt did the same by their secret arts. So Pharaoh's heart remained hardened, and he would not listen to them, as the Lord had said. The Lord turned and went into his house, and he did not take even this to heart. And all the Egyptians dug along the Nile for water to drink, but they could not drink the water of the Nile. Seven full days passed before the Lord had struck the Nile. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go into Pharaoh and say to him, Thus says the Lord, Let my people go, that they may serve me. But if you refuse to let them go, behold, I will plague all your country with frogs. The Nile shall swarm with frogs that, that shall come up into your house, and into your bedroom, and on your bed, and into the houses of your servants and your people, and into your ovens and your kneading, trough, kneading bowls. Frogs shall come up on you and on your people and on your servants. The Lord said to Moses, Say to Aaron, Stretch out your hand with your staff over the rivers, over the canals, and over the pools, and make frogs come up on the land of Egypt. So Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. But the magicians did the same by their secret arts, and made frogs come up on the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh called Moses and Aaron and said, Plead with the Lord to take away the frogs from me and from my people, 
And I will let the people go to sacrifice to the Lord. Moses said to Pharaoh, Be pleased to command me when I am to plead for you and for your servants and for your people, that the frogs be cut off from you and your houses and be left only in the Nile. And he said, Tomorrow. Moses said, Be it as you say, so that you may know that there is no one like the Lord our God. The frogs shall go away from you and your houses and your servants and your people. They shall be left only in the Nile. So Moses and Aaron went out from Pharaoh, and Moses cried to the Lord about the frogs, and he had agreed with Pharaoh, as he had agreed with Pharaoh. And the Lord did according to the word of Moses. The frogs died out in the houses, the courtyards, and the fields, and they gathered them together in heaps, and the land stank. But when Pharaoh saw that there was a respite, he hardened his heart. He would not listen to them, as the Lord had said. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your judgments that are in the earth. We do pray that you would uh, develop within our own hearts a great fear of you, of your glory, and your majesty, but also a love appreciation for your grace and mercy. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I began my ministry within the Orthodox Presbyterian Church by going to a small community called Brownwood, Texas. It was deep in the heart of Texas. In fact, it's just about in the center of the state. It's about three hours south, southwest of Dallas, Fort Worth. I remember listening to the radio stations coming out of Dallas, Fort Worth, the Metroplex. While I was there trying to establish a church, we had a, a group of people that had come together with an interest in forming an Orthodox Presbyterian church. And I remember the counsel that one of my professors at Westminster, professor of missions, farm missions, home missions, uh, Dr. Harvey Kahn, the counsel that he gave to me and others like me who would be going out to try to plant churches. He said, when you come into a community, interview a number of the leading people within the community to get to know the community. Find out what's going on. What are the significant problems? What are the encouraging trends? Just get a sense for the feel of the community. Is it hard to put your hand on their pulse and see what's happening? And so I did that. And I went around and I met with a handful of different people, representatives within the community. I spoke before of an interview I had with the pastor of the Mainline Presbyterian Church in town. Uh, I also had an opportunity to speak with uh, uh, the head of the water department there in Brownwood, Texas. Uh, that's a rather unusual, perhaps, individual to speak with, but I have my purposes. And so I come in and sit down with him and talk to him, and I don't know if he knew who I was at the start. I don't know if he recognized that I was a church planter or not. I rather suspect he thought I might have been a college student doing a report or maybe a journalist writing a story for the, the local paper. In any case, I was asking him about the community and issues with regard to water, and one of the things that he said to me was that there was, he had a concern for what he called range wars in the future over water supplies. Because water in Texas is rather a scarce resource and it has to be very carefully managed. And especially when you're out in West Texas, some of the drier parts of Texas, there can be tremendous competition for water by different communities. And so he was concerned that there would be uh, these range wars between different communities looking for access to water, to lakes, and rivers, streams, and that kind of thing. I don't think he had in mind violence or anything like that, but uh, competition among the communities. Well, after that interview, I thought to myself, maybe I should name our uh, mission or River of Life Presbyterian Church or something to that effect, noting the importance of water to the community and also the provision of the waters of salvation in the gospel of Christ. 
I didn't do that, but maybe I should have. In any case, we are very much aware of the importance of water. You might have somebody come to your door knocking, asking you to sign a petition for clean air, clean water, clean earth, and a donation to a particular political action group to that end. Uh, we all have an interest in clean water. I have an extra filter in my home to clean the water as it comes out of the tap. Uh, if that reserve should be uh, crimped, uh, taken away, uh, we'd be in a lot of trouble. This is what uh, God threatened Egypt, the whole nation of Egypt, uh, at the very start of the plagues that he brought down upon Egypt. Now, the Hebrew really doesn't use the word plagues so much as signs and wonders. These are wonders that God is performing, but they certainly come with a devastating impact upon the nation. Perhaps none quite so uh, meaningful and impactful as the destruction of the water supply throughout the land. And so Moses and Aaron had already spoken with Pharaoh about letting Israel go. They spoke to him a couple of times. The last time they spoke with him, they gave a demonstration with the staff that we saw the last time. The staff goes to the ground, becomes a snake or a serpent, and then it gobbles up the other serpents of the magicians. And so Pharaoh has an understanding of the power of that staff that Moses and Aaron bring with them. And it's interesting that God directs Moses and Aaron to come before Pharaoh with that staff, kind of as a, a reminder of the power that God has already displayed. You know, in many respects, God sometimes impresses upon our hearts something about Himself, some truth about Himself that we need to know. And then the repetition of an event or a time or a conversation or something brings that back to mind. Repetition is important. And the object lesson here was that God is the Lord. He is the Lord of Israel. And by consequence, uh, He's also the Lord of Egypt. Uh, you find that Moses and Aaron are mostly just talking about God as the Lord of Israel. And God's concern was for Israel. We talked last time about how God had a particular loving, gracious concern for Israel that separated them from Egypt. They were the objects of His love and favor. The Egyptians were not. On the whole, some would come with Israel and leave. But on the whole, Egypt was left to their sin, the rebellion. But God had a particular love for Israel and distinguished them. And God was demonstrating that He was their God and in control of their destiny. But in so doing, He showed that He was also the Lord of Egypt. And Pharaoh needed to hear that as well. And the staff was kind of a symbol of that lordship for Pharaoh. Every time he saw that staff, I have to think that a certain chill went through him. He went to look at that staff and see what was happening there. Well, Pharaoh had not listened, had not let Israel go. He rebelled against God. He hardened his heart, even as the Lord said he would. And now Moses and Aaron are instructed to go to Pharaoh when he is on his way or at the Nile River. It may be that he's going there to bathe, even as his daughter went to bathe when they originally found Moses in his uh, little uh, ark stuck there among the reeds in the Nile. He might have been bathing there. He might have been getting uh, a drink or what have you. Uh, it, and, and there is some speculation that because the Nile uh, was associated with the gods of Egypt, he might have been there for his morning devotions. In any case, he was there at the Nile. So there was a great object lesson there right before Pharaoh. This great, vast river with arteries that go throughout Egypt and water the whole land. A, a, a river on which the nation depends. They depend on it for their fishery 
uh, business. They depend on it for traveling, for commerce. Things would be shipped up and down the river in the way of trade. The river formed a barrier to any invading nation. So there was a military defensive nature to the river. Certainly, the river was there for water, for life, for agriculture. And so there were many reasons to have concern for this waterway. And with Pharaoh there right before it, uh, Moses comes and approaches him right there, as it were, making a point. This was not an ivory tower discussion that they were having about the nature of the end times and something off in the distance. This is here and now standing right before you. And so Moses and Aaron approach Pharaoh and they have a message from the Lord. Once again, the message is the same. God doesn't change his terms. Let my people go. That they may serve me. Uh, Phil, Philip Graham Reichen points to this word serve here. Let my people go that they might serve me. As in contrast to the way that Israel had been in service to Pharaoh. They were slaves to Pharaoh. And God is saying, I am the proper Lord of Israel. Not you. They will no longer serve you. They will serve me. And so God was asserting his rights over Israel. Going to set them free. And so he was directly challenging Pharaoh and his control of Israel. And so the demand is the same. And then God instructs Moses, and then Moses instructs Aaron to lift that staff over the Nile River and to turn the water into blood. That is gross. That would be horrific. Um, now, many in our modern age want to explain that away on naturalistic terms that really didn't become blood. Even as they try to explain away the staff of Moses not really becoming the serpent or snake, they're really at, at heart having trouble with God acting in history and time and being able to do what his own will chooses to do. So at heart, there's that rebellion against God and his actions in the world and trying to say that, well, we can explain everything without God. It's kind of like they've been in our public schools. We can explain math, science, we can explain the art and the literature without God. You learn about God in your church, but we don't need Him in the schools. We can explain everything without Him. No, that's not the case. And here, the Lord instructs Aaron to lift that staff over the Nile, turn it into blood, thereby demonstrating his lordship over history and time and the things of history. A naturalistic explanation really doesn't account for the, what we have here. Some say there were microorganisms in the Nile that overwhelmed it and it turned into a reddish color and maybe that created the stench. But how is it that it happened all at once as soon as Aaron puts his staff over the waters? It just happens at that moment in time. It's a little bit far-fetched. Um, there are other ways of describing it. They say, well, sediment from the, the, the land seeped into the Nile and turned the, the water red from the red earth itself as it churned and so forth. But again, this uh, red color, if you will, not only like considers the Nile, but also its tributaries and even people have pots, stone pots and wooden pots of water, they also turn to blood. How do they turn to blood if they're not part of the Nile River with all the sediment contributing to it? There is no naturalistic explanation for this. So either you can say, well, it's a mythological statement that uh, is trying to elevate God and make him into some kind of uh, a powerful being, or it's real history and time. 
Now, Israel believed that these things really happened, not just simply in Moses' time. And by the way, Israel was delivered out of Egypt. How did that occur? There's a cause and effect kind of relationship here. What is it that prompted Israel, a slave people, to be released from Egypt? Something happened in Egypt to spring them loose. What was it? It had to be pretty significant. Maybe this was it. In any case, uh, Moses' generation understood it. Generations to come, the Psalms would also speak of how the, the Nile River was turned to blood. And we see uh, in, in the future God bringing judgment on the waters of the earth in the apocalypse. So, God acts in history and time to accomplish His purposes. And you might take some, if you will, some pastoral counsel from this text, uh, noting that the Nile formed the life of Egypt. Everything really revolved and depended upon that water. And in many respects, people have their different forms of life that they depend upon. Things that provide them with entertainment or family relationships or uh, all kinds of things. Do you not understand that at any moment the blessings of life can be taken away and withdrawn? At any moment you can find yourself in a really bad spot. We are subject to the will of God at every moment of life. The health that you currently enjoy tomorrow may change dramatically. We don't know what might happen. Do not presume upon life. Understand that your life is lived out before God. Is it not then important that we be in a right relationship with God under any circumstances of life? So, the water was turned to blood. But there's more involved here than simply a battle with water, a battle with Egypt, a battle with their economy, and, and so forth. This was a battle with the gods of Egypt. And in a remarkable way, the turning of the water into blood has echoes on the past and Egypt's treatment of Israel. After all, it was the... Uh, midwives of Egypt that would go through Israel and require that the, the baby boys be slaughtered and their blood poured into the river Nile. And now God returns the favor, if you will, and turns the water of the Nile into blood for them in judgment. God is one who sees what takes place in history and time and brings about his own judgments. But there's more, there are gods there in Egypt. The gods of Egypt uh, included the gods of the Nile. Um, the, the Nile had a god named Hecate who was responsible for the midwives and responsible for uh, the fruitfulness of the fields and so forth. And when uh, God struck the Nile River and all the fish died up and uh, everything was at risk, he was striking this god in the face. Basically saying, you're nothing before me. You don't have control of anything here. I'm the one that controls the waterways. I am the Lord of the Nile. I'm the Lord of life. And the source of life for a nation depends upon me. Not upon the false gods that Egypt was worshipping. Philip Reichen talks about the gods of our American culture today that we worship where we uh, worship the gods uh, of comfort and ease and uh, prosperity and uh, the marketplace and so forth. And we're comfortable with the provision that these gods provide for us and we have no need for anything else, for a sovereign Lord. But again, God might attack those things from time to time. It's certainly, if any of you have invested in the stock market, you know, that your money can be gone in a day, or at least be dramatically reduced in a day. Um, 
this was a battle against the gods of Egypt, and God was showing that he himself was the Lord. The same occurs with the plague of the frogs. Uh, God tells Moses and Aaron to come to the waters, lift up that staff, and bring frogs up out of the Nile. They go all over every part of Egyptian life. Maybe this is where Kermit the Frog had its beginning. But uh, Philip Reichen talks about the humorous, humorous aspect of this and that you couldn't get away from these frogs. The frog's in your bed. It's in your bed. Can you imagine turning around your bed? There's a frog going, ribbit, ribbit. <laughs> you know, it was just horrible. Everywhere you turn, you pull out a pot to, to cook your uh, dinner and there's a, pop, there's a frog inside going, ribbit. It's just, it's horrible. And they stank too. I remember visiting Ukraine and we came across, uh, my friend Kati and I came across a, a small pond, the lake in a park there. And I heard this weird, strange, you know, like, and I thought it was an electrical shock or going on or something. You know, the things don't always work very well over there. I, I thought some spring was loose and was, Grinding against something? I asked what it was, he said, it's frogs. So we have a little joke between us, crack, crack. You know, when things go wrong, just crack, crack, laugh at it. It's just frogs. But God, again, was doing a battle with the gods of Egypt and showing his supremacy over all. He is the Lord of life. You know, just as the scriptures tell us about the judgments of God upon the wicked, upon Egypt, upon their sin and rebellion against people today, and ultimately God will indeed bring a final judgment upon all mankind and cast people not into a river like the Nile, but into a lake of fire, which will not be quenched and goes on forever and ever. This turning of the water to blood lasted for about seven days, and then there was passion and it was stopped. Similarly, when Pharaoh came to Moses and pleaded with him to pray on his behalf, God was pleased to remove the frogs. God had a temporary a judgment on Egypt. And we can see that God was compassionate even for the Egyptians, even for Pharaoh, full well knowing that Pharaoh was going to turn around and deny him. God nonetheless showed mercy to him and compassion and moved the frogs out of the field. And so we find the mercies of God at work in our world today with the sun rising and having fruitful seasons and rains coming down to water the fields. God is compassionate to even the wicked every day. But to the church, he reminds us that there is a greater river Providing for us. Psalm 46 talks about a river whose streams make glad the city of God. And so there is this vision of the great church of the Lord, like Jerusalem of old, that had a source of, of water right within the city itself. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. It was a, a remembrance of the Garden of Eden, which had a river running through it to water the garden. The presence of God among His people is like this river of life that flows and brings blessing to all. The prophet Ezekiel, in the 47th chapter of his prophecy, sees this great river that flows out of the temple there in Jerusalem. It comes out of the south portion, around to the east, and flows out towards the east, down towards the Arabah, and it empties into the, the Dead Sea. And it gets deeper and deeper as it moves along further and further away from the temple. It's a great vision of the progress of the kingdom of God and its expansion throughout the earth. Indeed, how it brings refreshment, turning the brackish salt waters fresh and bringing fish into those waters. And it gets deeper and deeper and deeper as history moves on moves on. God's kingdom is advancing and there's a great river of life flowing from the city of God, from the gospel of Jesus. 
Jesus himself meets with the woman at the well of Samaria and says to her, from your innermost being will flow rivers of living waters. Come to Jesus, believe on him, and he will take that brackish, dead water in your heart and clean it out and bring you new living water, making you alive, causing you to be regenerated. And then at a great feast there in the city of Jerusalem itself, Jesus on the last day of the feast says, If any man thirsts, let him come to me and drink. And out of his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Jesus was the one who offers us refreshment so that we no longer thirst again for the things of this world. Are you thirsty for life? Do you want satisfaction, true satisfaction? Do you want to know that your life is more meaningful than just what you're experiencing now? That there is a future for you. Indeed, a grand future. Everlasting life. Come to Jesus. Seek that water of life. Ask Him to give you a drink of that. That you might live. Believers in the Lord Jesus, this is what God has done for you. And make you new. We have this new water of life within us. And we can be a refreshment to those who are around us. That water that proceeded from the temple of Ezekiel's vision had trees bearing fruit on each side of it in its season for the healing of the nations. We are here to be a blessing to those around us. And we are such by the indwelling Spirit of Christ as He renews our minds and hearts, fills us with joy, love, peace, patience, kindness, and goodness, and so forth. These fruits of the Spirit are a blessing to those around us. And we can be a means of life to others as well. As we yield ourselves to the Spirit of Christ. May we not be like Pharaoh, turning away from the Lord as soon as the difficult times go away. When things get better, the natural man just goes back to his ordinary way of living. There are what are called foxhole Christians. Perhaps you've heard of them. When the bullets are flying, they're in the foxhole praying to God for deliverance. When the bullets stop, and they get out of the foxhole, they go back to life as usual and forget all about the commitments they made. We should not be that way. We should listen to God's word. Trust in the Lord Jesus and allow that river of life to flow within us so that we might be that. Father, we thank you for your word and pray that your spirit will encourage our hearts by it, helping us to know that we have everlasting life through Jesus Christ. We pray for your blessing on your word that we will be encouraged and comforted by it. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs>
immortal, invisible, the only God, the honor and glory forever and ever. Amen.